Rock Harbor. We just want to say thank you. Thanks for blessing my family, for blessing my kids, and just making it a really special evening for everybody. They had a lot of fun, we had a lot of fun, and they're gonna walk away a stronger community and a stronger group of kids. And for that, thank you very much. Hey man, that's awesome. Thank you guys for donating so many items so quickly and then showing up, putting on incredible booths and what a, what a great way to be involved in our community. That's been our prayer from the very beginning and these are one of the moments that after we look at five and a half years of Rock Harbor that it's a, an incredibly proud, exciting, um, sharing the message of Christ in a loving manner and meeting our community exactly where they're at. So thank you guys so much uh, for doing that. We love Meridian Elementary, the Boys and Girls Co Club, and uh, being able to partner with them. It was just an incredible night. Um, hey, we're going to be in Galatians 4. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to, to turn there. And uh, we're in our series uh, called Set Free. And Paul, who planted a bunch of church in, in Galatia, uh, which is modern-day Turkey, planted a bunch of churches. And it's like Uncle Paul's writing a letter, okay? He's writing a letter to his kinfolk and his brothers and sisters in Christ and just saying, hey, why are you living like you're in chains? You've been set free. He's saying, hey, we don't need to live like we used to live when we were controlled by religion. We have a relationship with Christ and we have the opportunity to be alive in him. And just like John, a couple weeks ago, and Brandon, as I was gone, I got to speak at a church across town, which is just awesome. Uh, John and Brandon were sharing about the grace of God. We don't deserve it. And I just need to mention a couple things about their message, because part of it was just wrong. I mean, there were things that they said that were absolutely not right. First off, John called me a hypocrite, okay? And I just want to call John a liar, okay? John is a liar. He, I mean, I don't know, he photoshopped a bunch of my clothes and put the Minnesota Vikings on all of my stuff. And I don't have a problem with the Vikings. They've never hurt anybody, okay? <laughs> yeah, what's up? And then, like, if John's in here, I'm trying to avoid con like, eye contact with him because he's kind of like, when he looks at me, he's like a grandfather to me, you know? And so, <laughs> that was good. So, I don't want to, you know, be too rude about it, but he was saying that. And the truth is, is they both rocked on my, they were going after my heritage, I was born a cowboy, okay? I was born into the Dallas Cowboys. I liked them long before they were criminals. I liked them when they were criminals and we were winning Super Bowls. I liked them when we were not criminals but not winning Super Bowls. And then I like them now when we're criminals again and hopefully we'll win a Super Bowl, okay? So point is, it's part of my heritage. Then Brandon ripped on Kansas. That made like three of us mad. All, all three of my family members, okay? We were all ticked off about that. Um, no, he was just saying different things. But apart from those bad parts of their message. They did a really great job. And I love the part they each talked about the grace of God. It's an undeserved favor. And apart from God, we are nothing. And specifically, when we surrender to the grace of God and push aside religion and surrender our life to the relationship that God is in pursuit of uh, with us, that's where we'll find freedom. That's where we'll be set free. The middle of Galatians 4 it talks about that. And so we're going to not spend as much time because Paul's kind of like that, that uncle, that well, mom or dad that repeats themselves. And so he's making sure that uh, we understand that. And so that's what the, is in the middle of Galatians 4. We're going to start in uh, verse number one. It says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he's under the guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. What's great about these uh, five verses here, two times it makes reference to God's timing. One of the things it says, it says, until the date set by his father. That's important to mention because last night my freshman daughter went to homecoming and she went with a group of friends. She did not go with a guy because there has not yet been a date set by her father. Okay, so <laughs> it is important. This is very biblical. She's, she, there may come a day that she asks. There may be a neighbor kid. There may be some like dirty, rotten sucker that wants to maybe invite her to something and then Okay, I'm just going to stop there. 
there, I've got to use some good judgment, but it's not a date that's yet been set, okay? But when the fullness of time had come is another one, when the fullness of time had come. See, when we look at that, we think of the fullness of time. We think about, well, it's my fullness of time. Like, I've, I just prayed about this 15 minutes ago, and I'm ready for an answer, God. It's talking specifically about Jesus being sent for us when the fullness of time had come. When God said, now is the appointed time. To wait on God in that. Because often, we prayed 15 minutes, we prayed, or we're asking for something, or it seems as much as we can fathom that now is the moment, or now is the time, or sometime really quick, we will get an answer to this prayer, God will come through in this certain way. But it's saying, in God's perfect timing. Maybe you've heard old preachers say something like, God ain't never late. He ain't never early. He always on time. I, I don't talk like that, but I've heard people talk like that. <laughs> but it's really true. He isn't late. He isn't early. He's always on time. But what about us in the waiting? Because maybe for you, it's been something you've been praying for a relationship to be restored, and you've asked God for a long time. Or you're waiting, you're saying, God, give me that opportunity to have this conversation with a friend that we've gone separate directions. Maybe it's in your uh, parenting that you have fear has kind of crept in uh, to your life and you're just waiting and you're saying, God, I just want to see this prayer answered for my son or for my daughter. We're waiting. Maybe it's a, you're waiting on a pregnancy. You're waiting and you said, God, I am in this moment of waiting. Um, There's been some discouragement in it. We're waiting for healing in this or we're asking that you would give us the desire of our heart. Maybe, it's, maybe you have adopted, or you're adopting, or you're waiting to adopt, and you're in a season of waiting. It could be in your marriage that you have prayed for healing. We're starting a series three weeks from today. It's called From This Day Forward, and it's, uh, we're going to be talking about a fresh start in our relationship with God, in our marriages, in our singleness, and asking God to do something, renewing and growing uh, a a commitment with him from this day forward. It's going to be a great time for you to invite people. We'll have invite cards and all that next week. It's a great opportunity to invite people, um, whether single or married, but in that time of waiting, saying, God, what do I do? And maybe for some of you, you have prayed um, a prayer request that only God can do, and you believe that if, if God would do this, the miracle that it would be, but it's not happening. And my heart, and I know with a a room of this size, a lot of us have come in waiting. And maybe some of us, you've seen something answer after you've waited a very long time. But I just want to take an opportunity to pray because there may be some financial things or some work situations or even just tension where you sit right now next to a friend or a spouse or you're thinking about a child and you're just asking God for the miraculous to know that he's with you in the waiting. God, you know our hearts and we lift up to you that thing, those things that we're waiting upon. For some, we're grieving and we're asking you to heal us. For some, we're asking questions about why and we have yet to get that answer. Maybe it's something very specific, something very tangible. But we believe all things are possible through you. God, I pray that we would trust you and know that in the fullness of your time, you may give us an answer to that. It may look different than what we're praying. But God, we would be patient. We would be gracious. We wouldn't be judgmental of the decisions, the choices, and the realities of your hand. We believe that you are with us in this. We ask for your guidance and encouragement as we study today. We ask in your name, amen. Verse number five, it comes directly out of that, and it talks to us as sons and daughters, and I love that. It's like a good father that wants to give good gifts to his kids. He says, so that we might receive adoption as sons, and because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. So this is an incredible picture that Paul gives us, and it's actually mentioned multiple times throughout the Bible about this adoption, that God 
is adopting us. He's choosing us. He desires a relationship for us. And the thing that's different about adoption as opposed to like, hey, we're going to have a child and it's, you know, the things are in motion and it's just like this is going to happen in this many months. With adoption, there's a lot of choices involved. And for my wife and I, adoption is very close to our heart. And so for us, uh, we had been married for about four years, and we hopped in the car, and we were driving to Yakima, Washington, and we didn't have children yet because we were on the five-year plan, okay? We had hit about four years, and we hop in the car. We get to about Caldwell, and my wife is like, hey, uh, let's, let's start a family. And I'm like, we're in Caldwell. Um, <laughs> like, now? Um, <laughs> and um, so we're t- I'm like, so we, it, that's a long trip, okay? That's like, like she brought it up at Caldwell, you know, like why not like Sunnyside, you know, <laughs> Washington, like hey, 40, last 40 minutes of the trip. Nope, it was like five hours. Let's just say the conversation was pretty good. I was pretty quiet between Baker City and LeGrand. Um, like I didn't want to talk about it. Then I was like, oh, we got to see the in-laws. Better start talking now. So we start talking a little bit later. And needless to say, about nine and a half months later, we had Kiki, okay? Uh, praise God, you know, yay, we have Kiki, you know. 16 months after that, we had twins, okay? Um, Awesome, but irresponsible um, (laughs) to have three kids within 16 months of each other. I mean, that wasn't the plan. The plan was like, okay, hey, 18 months apart. You know, the whole five-year plan was like gone, so I just gave up at that point. I'm like, who cares about the distance in between kids? She's going to win. So we have uh, the twins, and uh, just super exciting. And then in, the, in our conversation, we had talked about adoption. We both felt like we had it on our hearts before we got married. And then we began to move through the conversation of adoption and what that uh, could look like. And we started reading and uh, uh, my wife was on blogs and those people that write blogs are like, they manipulate your mind and, and all sorts of things. And um, so we're reading about stuff. We went to an adoption seminar and learned more. We were praying about China, asking, okay, domestic, international, and just asking questions and start to realize, like, there's a lot of choices within adoption, a lot of decisions to be made, which is really cool when you pair this up to this passage and see the correlation that God chose us. He didn't say that he was obligated to us, like we all of a sudden showed up and we were born and he's like, ah, oh, great, there's another one. You know, it, it, that wasn't the plan. Like, there was a choice that was made and you've been chosen, you've been set apart. So as we begin our conversation about adoption and just praying through things, uh, we settled on the country of Ethiopia and um, began to step through and through a friend, we got connection, connected to an agency and God began to do a great work, but there were choices to be made and so we had to make a decision, okay, boy or girl, sibling set, ages, and we said, hey, we would like a sibling set and we kind of mentioned some ages. Next thing you know, we get a referral of a little girl. And Yemi came into our family, and God blessed us, and she was just uh, joyful, and I didn't know English, and was stubborn at times, and had really long legs, and wore Crocs. And so, um, <laughs> with socks, I mean, don't knock it. Um, but that was, that was our, our, our fourth child, and it was great, and Chrisanna was always thinking, hey, what about five? And I'm thinking, if it's a boy because we have entirely too many girls. We were even, it was like, you know, like it was three. And then I'm like, we gotta get another boy. We gotta win this battle. You know, the guys need to dominate and win. And so I said, let's go for a boy. And so we said, okay. So the choices started coming down the pike again. Okay, six year old boy, seven year old is kind of what we said. And then we get matched with a boy that comes, come to find out is eight years old. And so we're like, okay, eight year old boy, okay. And that's when Natsy came into our life. And as we met him, we said, how old are you? And he said, I'm 10. And we're like, oh. Paperwork said you're eight, so okay, somebody lied. Um, uh, so we start walking through that, that process, and the good news is we have a really big seventh grader, okay? He is a full-grown man, seventh grade, and so um, it's working well. He plays defensive tackle, and we're looking at scholarships, and so um, God is good. <laughs> so, but this whole process and bringing Natsy into our home, and it was just, just incredible. But you think about the choices that were involved with that. And six months later, as my wife was working at World Relief, we had an opportunity to spend time with a 16-year-old boy that had moved here and was living downtown with a couple other refugee men. 
but he was 18 on paper and 16 without a family or a home, and we said, hey, we could go spend time. That's, our, that's his newborn picture that we took with him. Um, <laughs> But this is Maji, and we started spending time in what I thought was a soccer game. My wife was thinking, I think we got another kid, you know, and I was like, ah, oh, you know. And so through a process of uh, him coming over and then spending the night and then spending two nights and then spending the weekend and going to church with us, and we got tired of driving to Southeast Boise on a Boise Avenue to get clothes for him. We're like, why don't you just move in? It'd be a great idea. And how about we donate all of your earthly possessions to your roommates? So we left that twin bed. And... Um, and uh, grabbed some clothes, and he moved in and became our son. All those choices that go along with adoption. And we step back from it, and you recognize that even though there were choices, there was a calling. And you see, and you line that up with God's calling in your life and God's adoption of you, and it was just as planned. See, we fell short with our sin. But the Bible says that even though we've sinned, Christ died for us. We don't deserve him and his grace. We don't deserve sonship. We don't deserve to be heirs of the king. But he's picked us and he's chosen us. The sad thing is some of you are trying to earn your way into being adopted. You're trying to perform your way into someone saying, I pick you. You're trying out, hoping you're going to make the approval team. That when you die, maybe your good will outweigh your bad, or someone's going to hook you up, or maybe you've done enough to earn your way to him. And he's saying you haven't, and you never will. But I receive you. And my plan all along was be in unity with you and community with you. And I've literally given you everything in my only son. I gave him for you. That is my adoption. That is my choosing. You're no longer to be a slave to this world. Don't make that choice. Be a son, be a daughter, be an heir. Because when I look at our family... This picture, I don't see biological and adopted. We see our kids. As my wife looks at this picture, she sees like this is Kansas, and you can probably see 10 miles. She thinks there might be a kid like behind that tree over there that's supposed to be ours too. <laughs> that's what she sees. It's God's plan, it's God's design. And it's an absolute chaotic mess. And if you think about timing, you think about choices, we ask ourselves, like, what if it was supposed to be China? Or what if it was not supposed to be an eight-year-old? Like, did we steal someone else's kid and then that messed up everybody else's adoption process? And then you step back from it and you say, only God could do that. Only God can redeem and restore, redeem and restore. And only God can give you something that's more than you could ever imagine. And only God is gracious enough for me to get the chance to be a dad. Because verse 6 says, Abba, Father. Daddy. Not a formal term, but a less than formal term, one of relationship. For him to say, that's what I want for you. I'm after you. I'm chasing you. I want you. I desire a relationship with you. See, not everybody is supposed to adopt, but we have a biblical mandate and a calling as followers of Jesus to do something. Here's what the Bible says in James 1.27. It says, Religion that's pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. It doesn't say, because what we would say is like, hey, if I run into an orphan, 
Like if I see a situation, I'm going to meet that need. It says that we are to visit. We are to seek after. We are to go. And guess what? The beginning church in the day that they were writing this in Rome, a child that had a special need, a child that had a mental illness, a child that had a disease or was less than, they placed outside the city gates to raise themselves. But guess who came alongside and scooped up those children as their own? It was the Christians. It was the followers of the way. It was called the way because Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And they took it seriously to go after the orphan, to go after the widow. We will meet the needs. We will be Jesus to them. We will adopt them. That child couldn't earn it, but they were graciously given the opportunity to be part of a family. This is in the Bible. We can't turn a blind eye to it and say, well, I don't really know. As a church, we've been about this from the very beginning. November 26th, we're going to bring this directly in front of each of us. We're having the His Little Feet International Choir that's going to be with us that day. They're going to lead us in worship. We're going to see kids from a bunch of different countries, and they're going to be hosted with us for the weekend. They're going to be in service, quite possibly in the kids' ministry as well. But we are going to visibly see children that are orphans from other countries. And I'm praying that it reminds us in 208 and whatever area code that we also added to our state. But that in this place, just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And just because it hasn't been brought into us doesn't mean that we pretend as if it doesn't happen. We are to seek after, we are to visit, we are to go. And from the very beginning of Rock Harbor, our heart has been bent towards adoptions. We have an adoption assistance fund that people apply for grants and there's an opportunity for people to have assistance in that because it can be expensive. Also as a church, we partnered with Mana Worldwide from the very beginning and we have a feeding center in Guatemala. We also, three years ago, got to partner and build and start an orphanage and we have 22 kids that are ours that are being raised in Guatemala under incredible care that had no hope and were fully orphaned. But yeah, yeah, you can. And we, along with about 65 different ones of us from Rock Harbor, have been on a couple of different trips to go spend time with our kids down there. It's not open for adoption. So these kids, whatever age that they were brought in, will be raised in this orphanage. And we have caretakers there. But the, the, the orphanage that we built, I want to let you know, it's not like a lot of the orphanages that I've been to. The one that we built, you would stay there. You would sleep on that floor. You would spend time and you wouldn't think twice about it. You'd use that bathroom. The amenities are just incredible. They're getting education. We're ministering and taking care of our kids. But some of the orphanages that you've been in and that we've been around are kids that are waiting outside the gates hoping that someday that they will get to sleep in that bed that you and I would never stay in. And the dirt floors that we walk across and we see infants there and the potty chairs that you see six kids using the restroom at the same time just sitting on potty chairs it's also known as child care for 35 minutes and they spend time in that and you see flies and all sorts of insects all over and you see children with special needs that are not being cared for in the least and it breaks a dad's heart and it can break your heart as we walk through those places and those spaces that are so distanced from what we know. We would call that inhumane here, but that is a normalcy there. And it's actually something longed for by some children that grow up on the street where they can get a meal taken care of for them. They've been placed outside of the city, outside of the gates, but maybe someone with a generous heart or someone trying to make a little bit of money is providing a little bit of a need for a child. And we would walk through that and say, that is not right. I cannot believe that this is happening. And let me tie that directly to the heart of God in the scripture. When he walks through your life, he sees the same thing. Because you and I, apart from him, we are helpless and we are hopeless. We are without hope. 
And scripture tells us this in Ephesians 2, that we need to remember, we need to remember that there was a time that we were separated from Christ. We had no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ, you, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Are we good enough? Don't we do good? I mean, we live a pretty comfortable life. I mean, if you have two cars, you're in the top three to four percent of wealth in the world. But we're bothered that we don't have a fourth. How many of us have a three-car garage or a four-car garage and we can't even get a car in the garage because we have so much stuff in the garage where our car is supposed to go? There was a place that we once come from. We were a far off. We're helpless and we're hopeless. One of the most vivid pictures I've ever had in my life of being helpless was when our twins were in the NICU and we lived at the hospital for a month and we went home to take a shower and to come right back. And while we were gone, we got a phone call that said, Brady is not doing well. We tried to put a pick line in and it's not good. And we walked through the doors and we walked into that room and there were 12 people working on him. And there was a man that was literally, I still remember his hand, he was squeezing a bag breathing for him. A two week old that weighed under four pounds. And they said, you need to leave the room. And we're like, you don't know who we are. And we stood outside of those glass doors and they shut them and we couldn't even hear them at that point. And we're just watching this all happen. And the life and the breath of our son was in the hands of someone else. And it was literally in that moment as we prayed, like we've never prayed before at that point in our life, that God said, he's my son. He's my son. And if he would have departed from us that day physically, we trust God. And as we sat out there and we just waited and we saw everything begin to calm and we look over at his brother 10 feet away in his incubator snoozing. He's just like, I didn't even know what was going on. God really is in control. And we're helpless apart from him. And I'm going to read scripture that I don't think any one of us in our tolerant, good enough culture wants to hear. And we're not going to have this on our website because no one would come to our church. But here's the truth about you and I, Romans 3. It's written that there is none, not one of us righteous, no, not one. Not one of us understands and not one of us seeks after God. All of us have turned aside. Together we have become worthless not one of us does good, not even one. Our throat is an open grave. We use our tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under our lips. Our mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Our feet are swift to shed blood. And in our path, there is ruin and misery. And in the way of peace, we do not know. For there is no fear of God before our eyes. Welcome to Rock Harbor. And here's the problem. We think that that really, really doesn't apply to us. But apart from God, there is nothing good in you. I am a sinful, wretched man. And I have been a sinful, wretched man for my entire existence. And I will always be a sinful, wretched man. But for the grace of God, but for the adoption of a good dad that wants good things for me. But guess what I try to do? I try to sign my own adoption papers. I try to earn my way to him. I try to justify my actions and why I do things and why I don't do other things. I try to claim the glory of God. I would never say out loud, but I think in my mind, man, that was a really good message. And God is like, give me a break. You couldn't will a single person to my throne. 
but because of me, maybe I'll use you. Would you just surrender? Would you just trust? Would you just admit? See, some of you have built businesses. Some of you have built really good families. But God wants more than that. He wants a God-centered mission. He wants a God-centered business. He wants glory that we as men and women and sons and daughters of him will not touch. Touch not the glory of God. We need to read verses like that because we forget from whence we've come. We actually are helpless. That good thing that you've put together, those good people that are around you, God has given them to you. That child that you've been given, God has given that to you. That child you long to have. God has given you this season of trusting him. That marriage that has been lost, God is giving you an opportunity to trust him in that loss. That time of waiting for your spouse to come to Jesus, there's nothing more that you would rather have than them to come to know the Lord so you can walk in the ways with them. God is with you in that. Or guess what? We could begin to put our own plan together like Abraham did. And in Galatians 4.23, Paul references it because you know what Abraham did? Abraham was given a promise by God and God said, look at the stars. Those, my son, those will be the descendants of you. And Abraham is like, yes, that is right. I've been bestowed an incredible promise. And then he walked away and he said, but my wife is old and there is medically no way we could ever have a child. So maybe God needs my help. Hey, Sarah, what if we conspire together and I have a child with one of our slaves and that could be the son that God, maybe God needs help. And they have a son and God corrects them and God redeemed them and God restored them and God was faithful to the promise that he gave them. And they miraculously, Sarah had a son in the fullness of time, in God's perfect timing. Wow. And you and I do the same thing and Paul is reminding us, do not try to sign your own adoption paperwork. Do not try to earn, do not try to create, do not try to fabricate, do not try to be something that you are not. How about be what you are? And that's an heir of mine, a child of the king We're helpless without him. We're hopeless without him. There's only one way to him. And it's humbly by grace, through faith, believing what he has done for us. Why do we live like a slave? Verse 7 says, you're a son and an heir in God. God is not obligated to love you. He unconditionally loves you. Adoption, in our culture, it's expensive. There's a cost that goes along with it. Guess what? The same is true, the adoption from God. There was a big cost. The ultimate price was paid for us. It's painful. It's grueling. There's times of waiting. To prepare your heart and your home for a child that you just wait and just wait and just wait and just wait. God says, wait on me. You'll mount up on wings like eagles and you're going to soar. But trust me in my timing because my ways are higher than your ways. Salvation comes only from God. Hope and help only come from God. It's the only way. And this last week as we were in the office and I'm in there working on my message and I'm like, I need to be focused on it, but then John Link comes to my door, which, which, if you know anything about the Rock Harbor offices, we can be easily distracted. Um, we're relational. And um, John comes to the door and he says, hey, Keith, would you like to come be part of a grand finale? And I'm like, 
what do you mean? He goes, dude, there's a couple that came in that wanted to talk about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I think they're ready to receive Christ as their savior. And I thought like, if you're here, do you have anything going on? I'm like, I have nothing going on that's more important than that. Let's roll. And we go in there like two little schoolgirls, excited as ever. We come in the door. They start sharing their story. They're welling up with tears. And I said, let's just pray. I'm not going to pray. Why don't you guys pray? And we grab hands. And that man's hand was shaking. And the power of the Holy Spirit was coming into the room. And he was saying a very simple prayer, but a life-changing prayer. And putting his faith in Jesus Christ. And then his wife prays. And then John prays. And I look over at John. I'm like, "Uh, my allergies are really backing up, you know, something's going on and John's tearing up. I'm like, okay, I'm normal. Like God is in this place. And I got to have the front row seat to the adoption paperwork being signed in someone's life. And there is nothing like it. Helpless and hopeless. But the only one came and brought his love to them. And they graciously received it, something that they didn't deserve, but received it. Abba, Father, Daddy. See, getting the privilege to be a father is one thing. But the calling to be a dad, to hear my kids say, Daddy. See, my time with our oldest, Maji, was shorter than we could have ever imagined. And uh, in his phone, it said, Daddy. He was a full-grown man, and he called me Daddy. He could pick me up. He could throw me around. He could bench press me, which I couldn't him, but, and he called me Daddy. A title that I didn't deserve, but I was graciously given. And a calling to try to be for him, to emulate our Heavenly Father, to emulate Abba Father in the love that I had for Him and for the rest of my children. What an incredible honor. You've been chosen. You've been set apart for God's great work. You were not a mistake. You were part of His plan. And God wants more than just to be your Savior wants to be your dad. He chose you. He picked you. He set you apart for his glory. You've been set free as an heir of the king. And there's a verse that says this. It's written that no eye has seen nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man could ever imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. when our first daughter was born. She was a week late. We walked into the hospital with our ghetto blaster, a mixtape, and the song I can only imagine played perfectly as she entered into the world. And our twins, my wife's water broke and it was a mess. Not the water, but like the whole situation. I won't go there. Um, and we're driving fast to get to the hospital because I could. And each adoption was approached with doubt and concern and choices. But God designs and orchestrates and brings his grace that anything you and I think we could possibly mess up by our behavior, he comes in and he redeems and he restores it. Because he wants you to be free. The Bible says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And I'm inviting each one of us today to be set free that the desires of our heart would unite with those of the Lord. Because we're snow knit with him. And as choices come into our life, we recognize that we are heirs of the king. And there is nothing we could ever do to hurt that sonship being a son, being a daughter of the king. We have been set free because the king has set us free. He has signed our papers. God, 
I just pray in this moment because I know that there is so much weight upon us in our mind, in our heart, that we fall short. And we begin to judge ourselves and state all the reasons why we can't be used in a miraculous way. And we think that maybe that's just something in the Bible that was for people in that time and it doesn't apply to us. But you have called us sons and daughters. You have chosen us. And for those in this room that they are moved in their heart to surrender their life to you. They don't need me to lead in a prayer, but God, I pray that they would pray right now to receive you as their savior, to sign the papers, to see you adopt them. You've chosen us, you've set us apart. It's your desire that no one would perish, no, not one. And for those of us that struggle, those of us that are waiting, those of us that our trust has waned, we would be united in unity with you, trusting you and your timing and knowing that you're a good dad that loves his kids. And our hearts would long for those days that we can only imagine when we step into your eternal kingdom, into heaven, to rejoice and to worship you. Heaven is to be lived out now. Yes, an imperfect earth, but with the same heart of worship and desire, we pursue you. God, help us as we chase after the orphan. Help us to chase after those that you've placed because we don't want to take our airship and take the things that we've been given and be good with that, that we would share that with others. God, use the work through scripture that you've done in our hearts today. And we ask this in your name, amen.